Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask that you turn to Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel chapter uh, uh, 37, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Ezekiel 37, uh, while you're turning there, uh, uh, continue to pray for uh, uh, the situation there in the Ukraine. Uh, our missionary, or the one that we give the love offering to, made a trip yesterday and is back home safely. Uh, but continue to pray for him. It's a very volatile, dangerous situation right now. Uh, Ezekiel 37, beginning in the verse, first verse. Ezekiel 37, in the first verse, the Bible says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. <clears throat> he said unto me, Son of man, do these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter unto you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Mm -hmm. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came upon them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness to our church. God, we pray that you would send people according to thy will and not ours. Add to us as you see fit. This morning, bless your word to those that are here, Lord, that you would encourage us in, your, in the Lord, God, that you would do great things for your own glory and for your own honor. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, we'll be preaching this morning when, the God, when God asks you to do something impossible or he asks you to do something foolish in man's eyes something that makes no sense, something that has uh, no mankind reason about it, but yet and still he calls us to do it. Uh, we live in a very drab day today uh, when the gospel is largely ignored and people think it's foolishness even to do so, but our command has not changed. Go ye into all the world and teach nations. We're still obligated as the Lord's church to do that. And we live in a day uh, uh, where this seems a great miracle, and it certainly is, and we'll get into detail about it, but you know it's an equally great miracle when the Lord saves someone. Amen. Because they're just as dead they're just as dry and they're just as helpless as those people that we find laying in the valley of dry bones. Now there are some essential characteristics that we'll find that must be in place for this to occur. Uh, in the first verse again, the hand of the Lord was upon me. 
Now, we live in a day and age where that key element is almost ignored. I have friends that say as long as you do something that is uh, that is smooth, not smooth things, but long as it's in line and it's easy to follow, that that element doesn't matter. Well, I beg to differ. You can uh, uh, preach something very eloquent, but if you don't have the power of God, you've wasted your time. And that is, that is the case in the modern day. You find these people that are more philosophers than preachers, and they don't look for this essential element. The hand of the Lord was upon me. Next thing, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. Uh, the second thing that's essential is obedience. We find here that he was actually carried. Uh, uh, Brother Jared, I'd much be rather obedient than be carried. If you don't think it happens, look at Jonah in the well, and he followed God's obedience whether he liked it or not. That's a sovereign God. That's a God that gets things done in spite of you. But I want you to see here, he was carried away in the spirit. He, he was moved. He was obedient. Uh, only people in the uh, only people in the center of God's will does this happen to. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a preaching man. It can be any, any individual with a mind to serve God. And that's exactly what happened. And he set me down in the midst of the valley, which is, was full of bones. Now, a very unlikely mission point. A place where we'd say, oh, uh, <laughs> this would be a great place to start a work. It would be like going to Stewart County Memorial Gardens or the old cemetery up by the uh, Capitolite Church up there. Wherever we may go, that would seem in man's eye a foolish place to start a mission. That that would be a really dumb idea. Now, this is the genuine truth this morning that every one of us that are saved were so, at one time that dead. Uh -huh. Every one of us, and, and if you're not saved this morning, you're still that dead, you're still that dry, uh -huh. you're still that useless, you're still beyond all possibility of man. Now, that in the modern day is the, uh, it is the key thing. Men are not preached dead, graveyard dead. They're preached that they can make a decision. Well, let me be the first to alert you. Uh, dead bones don't make decisions. Dead bones don't follow. Dead bones cannot be led in a prayer. Dead bones are useless. Right. You know what? Dead bones don't even take offense to stuff. You can tell them how wicked and ungodly they are, and they'll lay there a heap of dry bones. We're there. We were talking about on the front porch uh, yesterday, Matthew uh, and Dash of the Kids was over there, and Matthew and I were talking. Uh, supposedly now, and not having a regular TV, I'm a little disconnected. You can be one gender one day, and if you want to decide and be the other gender the next day, that's okay too. You know what? That, that is horribly ungodly, but you remember those people are dead. They do not understand. They, they truly believe gender is no longer an issue. They're graveyard dead. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes you get so aggravated with a group like that, you get more angry than anything else. But I, we ought to be moved to pity. We ought, we ought to be moved to sorrow because that is their situation just like this. He, he assessed the whole situation and found that they were all dead. Verse 2, and caused me. Uh, didn't ask him, did he? He caused me. Uh, he literally made him do it. That's the God of the Bible. That's a sovereign God. That's a God that gets things done in spite of us. You know, somebody say, well, he's been mercifully used of the Lord. And I've used that term, maybe, maybe not. Maybe he, he was just caused to do it. Maybe he was under uh, the full, the full, the full power of the 
the Almighty, and he was caused to do it. And he calls me to pass them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, oh, they were very dry. Now, I want you to see it says that he caused him to go around him. Now, he landed, a, in, he landed uh, Ezekiel in this hopeless place, and then he commanded that he walk around. He, he observed the situation. Do you ever wonder uh, why it was that the children of Israel were commanded to walk around Jericho seven times? Number one, it pleased God. Yeah. And number two, I believe they were getting a good idea of just how hopeless and helpless this situation was. Jericho was a huge city. Jericho was a, a mighty city. Places where you got shot from the corners of the wall. And he says, I want you to walk around it every day for huh, seven days. And on seven days, I want, on the seventh day, I want you to walk around it seven times. Uh, foolish. And so now he tells Ezekiel, I want you to go around this pile seven different times. I, I, I mean, excuse me, one time. I want you to walk around and look at the situation for what it is. Now, me knowing my flesh and knowing the nature of the flesh, I believe after walking around, I've been more discouraged than ever. Okay, it's a valley of dry bones. It's big, it's dry, it's ugly. Well, you know what? If you genuinely with a mission's heart walk around Dover, that's what you'll find as well. Just a valley of dry bones. Yeah. Not, not much living here anymore. A lot of religion, we're in the South. But you know what it really is? It's a valley of dry bones. It's people depending on themselves, whether depend, uh, besides depending on Christ. Uh, it's just like Brother Jared was talking. You, you wonder, why can't they see it? Well, they're dead. Dead men don't even have eyes. And, and you think about this situation here. They're... <laughs> If you be way past dead, they're way past dead. They're not even any flesh hanging on them anymore. That's our condition outside Christ. That's our condition without His goodness and mercy and glory being in our lives. We're just like these skeletons, and that's where they were. Verse 3. And he, meaning the Lord God, said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now you think about that. What would your answer be? Now be honest with me. If you saw that situation and the Lord God said, Larry, can these live? My impulse would be to say, no. There is no way. Think about uh, the people in our government offices today. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the Speaker of the House, oh, she always comes to my mind first. Can she be saved? You betcha. Will she? I don't know, but I know certainly she can. She's alive. What about our president? What about our vice president? Can they be saved? Now, I haven't seen much of this. I, Maybe it was Don or Matthew. Somebody tell me about the uh, the uh, young lady they're looking at as one of the chief justices. Uh, that's an appointment you have for the rest of your life. Once you're in, you're in. And um, they asked her, one of her questions was about gender. And you know what? She was afraid to answer them. You know what her final answer was? I'm not a biologist. Can that woman be saved? I believe she can. I believe when you look at any possible person living on earth and you look and say, can they be saved? If it's the mighty will of God, most certainly they can. Are they past dead? You betcha. Are they outside the scope of the Almighty? Never, ever, ever, ever. Uh, and, and so we see that uh, Ezekiel probably had more faith than we and said, well, you know God. Now, uh, 
I hope he was saying you're sovereign and you know. But have you ever avoid, avoided a question? That, that woman that's running for one of the chief justices, she's avoided a lot of the questions, hasn't she? Maybe Ezekiel was like, well, you know, Lord. You, you know, we live in a day and age today where there's a lot of pass the buck, ain't it? Don't want to give a direct answer. Uh, don't, don't want to say yes, no. Uh, everybody says maybe. And, and so we see here that they, uh, that Ezekiel says, you know, uh, verse 4, again, he said unto me, prophesy upon those bones and say to them, oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Uh, what an amazing thing. And you think about if the Lord asked you to do this, uh, literally go to a place in, in, in an arid climate like uh, the Middle East, uh, like around the nation of Israel. Listen, they dry up like this. Here in the deep south where, or in the mid-south where we have lots and lots of humidity, a body rots. It doesn't dry out. In this, this area, it, it dries out. It, it, it don't uh, have the odor. It just all of a sudden, it, it's gone and it's dried up like our, our western states out there. And he said, Ezekiel, I want you to preach to that. You think, well, that's stupid. Right? Jared, you want to go with me to a Sodomite bar and we'll preach? Well, Larry, I do a lot for you, but that's where I draw the line. <laughs> right? That's your valley of dry bones. Our public school system is deteriorated to nothing more than a valley of dry bones. That's our valley of dry bones. Many, many churches, and I use that very loosely, they've deteriorated to nothing but entertainment stations in the valley of dry bones. That's the why they don't get it. So we find here that the Lord God of heaven is asking of Ezekiel almost an impossible task, something we would view very, very foolishly, but I want you to see, he says, I want you to preach to those dry bones. Listen, he's still saying that today. He wants us to preach to the dry bones, yeah. to the people that are outside hope, to people that you think already would never respond. That's our mission field today. That's where we're to be at. That's where we're to be out preaching. You know what? We come down here to the house of the Lord and we ought to come to worship, lift holy hands, uh, praise His name, and we sit here like a bunch of lumps on a log and never praise Him and never sing to His might. Yeah. This is the mission field. It has nothing to do with these four walls. It really doesn't. And so we find that he asked what mankind would think was a foolish, a foolish request. Verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bodies, Behold, I will cause breath to enter unto you, and ye shall live. So the, the text, the preaching of that day was bones, you're going to live again. And... <laughs> At first, there was no response. There was nothing going on. You ever preached when there was no response? And all those blank looks, all those, like, you know, I would rather be somewhere else, all those thinking about the back 40, that's your dry bones. That's the one that, that, that has no interest. That's the one that, that could care less. Uh, there's a, a missionary right now to... Uh, <laughs> the African-American populations of Cincinnati, Ohio. And that is a rough, rough area. Me and Donna got lost one time, and that's where we ended up. And uh, you know what people would say about that? They're beyond hope. It is, it is a rough, scary area. And, uh, and, and this, this boy, you know what he's doing? He's preaching to a valley of dry bones. Now, he gave me his own personal testimony uh, of when the Lord saved him, and his mother would beg him to church and beg him to church, and he had dreads and uh, hair down to here, which is mostly fake hair, and, uh, 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 and just, 
But he, this, and I can't imagine as a grown man, I guess he was in his early 20s, laying his head over on his mama's lap and sleeping. Now, if I'd have been the preacher, I wouldn't want to come along like that and pull that head back up where he could listen. But you know what? Far better than that, God spoke to him. Out of the valley of dry bones, he woke him up. And now in the very community that's without hope, he's down there preaching the true gospel. That is what we need to see happen. Uh, nothing is outside the possibility and, and the reality of what our God can do. And so we see obedience to what we would perceive as a hopeless task. Verse 6, And I, meaning the Lord God, and I will lay sinews uh, upon you. It's what we call tendons in the modern day. Uh, I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now, I want you to see there's about a four-step process he's going to accomplish to make these uh, dead bones live. And None of them can be accomplished by man. Uh, you ever see man create flesh? No. You know, this will interest you. Uh, you know, the only thing we can do is borrow flesh from something else. We do organ transplants, but you know what? We can't create organs. We have to have somewhere to harvest them from. We can't even make skin. Right. Been in healthcare all my life. You know what? We've made no progress from in that field. And you know why? Because only God can do that. So God said, I'll, I'll, I'll bring the flesh back on them. I'll get the job done. Now, in redemption, it is the very same way. You can't invite Jesus into your heart when you're a heap of dry bones. You can't breathe a prayer. You can't look down, you know, th this is the Armenian's way that God looked down through eternity and saw who would believe. Listen, that's foolishness. He didn't do that. He foreordained them to believe. And you know why? Because they were nothing but a heap of dry bones. And he knew it. Uh, he understood it. He, he, he knew uh, at least... Uh, in our understanding, it was an impossible task. So God's plan always worked, always will work. So he was going to uh, reassemble these people. Verse 7, so I prophesied. He preached. Never a getting off place. So I preached. I prophesied. I did what I was told. You know what? Uh... You know, and, and this is why I still preach today, and I'll keep preaching by the mighty help of God until I lay this flesh back down. But I want you to know, not a lot of people here, is it? Not a lot of interest shown in the modern day. Well, number one, I'll say that I'm in the wrong spot, and I'll include myself in that. I need to be out there. Do y'all need to preach to? Sure. But we need to glorify God when we come here. Out there is the mission field. Find you a valley of dry bones and preach. Be obedient. And you know what? It may seem hopeless. I preached down in Nashville, close in the, in the black town of Nashville, and the abortion clinic is down there. I just bought from the abortion clinic. And... Uh, Giving out some tracks and stuff. And a man came up to me and said, I want a bottle of whiskey. And I said, well, you won't get it from me. And he made me a little mad. And then as I look back on that, you know, he was doing exactly what his flesh dictated him to do. It, wa it wasn't against me. He was dead. He was the dry bones. He had nobility. But you know what? As I look back on that situation, I was in the very spot where the Lord God had ordained me to be, and I was preaching to 
a hopeless, useless, unbelievable people. And every time that anybody preaches, that's exactly what they're doing. We need to understand and know that uh, there's a lot of people that say they're saved that it's not. There's dead bones all around us, and they need the gospel. So I prophesied, prophesied as I was commanded, or as I was told, I was obedient, and as I, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Now, you know what? It had to be a pretty scary thing as he's preaching and, and, and lifting up the gospel and things started going, shh, 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 shh. You know what? It had to be a little bit scary to hear, hear those things rattling against one another. That, that would have uh, scared me. See, sometimes when we have results to preaching, it's a little, it's a little offsetting, is it not? Uh, I remember Sister Millie told me one time when Sue Downs was saved, she was over at uh, Jackson, I mean, uh, the Duke and General Hospital with her. And she looked at Millie and said, Millie, I need to be saved. It shook Millie up. She said, we need to call Brother Downs. <laughs> Shake you up a little bit, won't it? Uh, are you prepared for that one? Someone out of the, out of, just out of left field says, I need to be saved. Either someone that is just what you call, think is beyond hell, or one of the people that you perceive the most godly in the world began to cry out for help. See, if I was above the valley of dry bones and I, I began to hear that shaking, I would be a little bit scared. You know what we need? In 2022, we need to hear a little shaking. Yeah. And, and you know when it happens, we don't need to be scared. We need to be looking forward to it. We need to be excited about it because we haven't seen it in so long. I, I would dare say at least at first it would scare us. It, it would be a little upsetting. It would be a little bit troubling to see, but oh, how we need it. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And that was just the, the first step. Uh, some people say that's where the shakers got their idea, that got that name, the shakers. I don't know if that's true. I also heard they were an offshoot of the Quakers, so I don't know which would be true. But you know what? Uh, I do know this. God did the movement. Them, them dry, dead bones did nothing. They, they accomplished nothing. They had nothing to contribute. And they started shaking on their own by the power of the Almighty. You know, I know, and I didn't understand it all then, but I know when the, the Lord saved me, he made me, in a, he made me aware of my sin because without Without him opening my eyes to it, there was no way I would ever perceive it because I thought I was a good kid. Isn't it, isn't it a glorious thing when, when the Lord God just turns the light on one day and you see how needy you really are, how hopeless and helpless it is? And so we see that that's exactly what was happening here. And when I beheld, so he looked at his congregation after hearing these, these, these rattling noises and seeing things pulled together. And when I beheld, lo, sinews came upon, uh, sinews and flesh came upon them. Now, uh, ligaments, which is also a sinew, is uh, bone to bone. It's a little uh, tough, almost wire things that hold your bones together. And then the uh, other is what holds muscle to bone. And they're pretty strange looking flesh. But you know what? Those things that hold it all together is useless without muscle. You ever, ever seen one of those puppets that you do like this and you can do the walking and stuff? That's kind of like ligaments and tendons with no muscle. All that's really proved pulling them in strings and they're good and they're and as soon as you let them down they're going to go down 
And then the muscle fell upon them. You know what? Uh, that had to be something to see. Can you imagine as his preaching is going forth, he saw sees all this beginning to happen. Uh, I'm sure he stood amazed. Uh, when people are troubled by the gospel, even today, I stand amazed because it's outside our scope. It's outside our ability. And when people begin to be convicted of their sin, they begin to understand that their nature is holy and completely against God. You know what? That's just like the flesh falling upon the skeleton. It's the miracle of the Almighty, and He is the one <clears throat> that will get the job done. Notice the problem at the end of verse 8. And there was no breath in them. See, the, uh, the accomplishment has to be through the Almighty. How did Adam become a living soul? So God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and he became a living soul. But you know what? His sin ended that. Not only... Uh, when he sinned that it began a time clock on, on his flesh, it also began a time clock on his soul. Adam, where art thou? He had to sum it up himself, did he not? Now, vocation, God knew that. But he wanted uh, Adam to understand he was sinful, that he was on a death trap now, and that he'd done it unto himself. And to every one of us that would hereafter be, Adam laid our sin upon him. And we have that nature. We are so wicked. We don't even understand it sometimes. We're so wicked that uh, huh, huh, we're dead to spiritual things. You know why people act the way they do? They're dead to spiritual things. Yeah. They, they, they have no clue. They, they have no understanding. And so we find that the chief problem still remained, and that was that they had no life. Keep preaching. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Now, I've never been directed by the Almighty to preach to the elements, but apparently that's a, a, a reality that could happen. If you don't believe that, I know Jesus did it twice. Peace be still. He's in the hinder part of the ship. They all got uh, disturbed and worried, and they went in there and said, Jesus, wake up, we're drowning. Oh, ye of little faith. Peace be still. And then another time as he was walking along the sea, and I think it's Mark's gospel, said he would have passed him by. <laughs> and, and they cried out to him. He, he was going to, you know, his commitment was that I'll meet you on the other side. <laughs> and he would just go in that way. And then Peter said, Lord, bid thou come unto me. Got out of there, started walking toward the Lord, saw the waves and the wind, and, and was about to go down. And picked him up and set him into the ship. And so we see that that's, that's, a, that's a real thing that happens. Now, if the Lord Almighty ever spoke to me and said, Larry, I want you to preach to the Son, I would be hard-pressed to do it. Jared, I want you to preach to the sea. It would be a very difficult thing, would it not? Because it's outside our realm. It's outside our understanding. See, everything the Almighty asks of you is not going to make sense to this thing right here. You, you've missed it about 18 inches. Obedience to the outside of normal will be the hardest thing you ever do. It'll be the most difficult thing that, is, that, that ever enters into your ministry. And he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind. 
Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Now, we come to verse 9, and it's an element of compassion. Preach to them that they may live. Let me stand up. How much, how much do you love the lost? They got to have preaching. I don't care how despicable and how ungodly you've seen them to be. Preach to them. Tell them of the goodness of God. Tell them that there is a Savior. Tell them they do not have to die in that condition. Preach to them. <laughs> you don't have to lead them to Christ, but you can tell them who Christ is. Yeah. See, we, 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 we fail in that element. So, uh, once again, <laughs> and this time I want you to see the key element is this, that Ezekiel didn't question him. You remember the first time he said, Son of man, can these bones live? Thou no, knowest. Ezekiel, I want you to preach to the wind. He never said one thing about it. See, as we stand, uh, as we grow in Christ, his request of us and his demands of us will be easier and easier to obey. And if they're not, uh, dear friend, make your calling and your election sure because you may not have what you think you have if you don't grow in obedience to Christ. And he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So, I prophesied as he commanded me. Now, uh, we live in a hard, hard day. Prophesy, preach, teach, keep going. Don't give up. Uh, I can't remember. Y'all remember all the Fortner brothers, preacher brothers. And there were some brothers and some nephews and whole college preachers. Well, there was one that was in West Tennessee in Jackson, started Emmanuel Baptist Church right in, as you go into Jackson. Used to pass it every time I'd go down there for clinicals. You know what, uh, what that uh, ungodly bunch uh, in Jackson did? They opened up a great, uh, a gay bar right beside Emmanuel Baptist Church. You know what Brother Fortner did? He began to preach to those people. <laughs> See, there will always be opposition. Just preach. Just prophesy. Is it impossible? Most of us would think so. But God is good. He's able. Just preach. Prophesy. So this time, without that questioning spirit, he began to preach to the wind, a very foolish request, a, a, a prophecy to a, an object that is not even living, he began to preach to. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these bones are the house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, and we are cut off for our parts. Now, I want you to see that this is the modern age church. This is what the Lord's church has come down to just as the nation of Israel has come down to in this day. <laughs> We're bones. We're not getting the job done. Our bones are dried. You ever feel dried up? Like there's nothing left to do? But there's nothing left else to preach. There's nothing left else to sing. That's when where Israel was at. Now, when you get to that, we think to ourselves, oh, it's just me. No, you're doubting the Almighty. 
You're doubting preaching to whom you're supposed to preach. You're doubting his ability to breathe life into dry bones. And so we're just to continue. We're, we're just to uh, we're just to go forward in what he's given us. Now, one more place, and uh, we're going to close. Ephesians chapter 2. Very familiar verses of Scripture. I've preached in your hearing many times, but now I want you to think about the valley of the dry bones. Paul says to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 2 in the first verse, And you have he quickened, made alive, breathed in life, brought the bones together. You have he quickened who were dead, dry, uh, all rotted in trespasses in sin, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also ye all had your com our conversation, behavior in times past, and the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Notice the past tense on love. You know, uh, he did, he loved me in eternity past. He loves me as I live now, and he'll love me in glory to come. He's always loved me. Now, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened or made us alive together, by grace are you saved. That's the only explanation. You know what? Uh, the Lord didn't save me to preach the gospel. He saved me by grace. He didn't preach you. Uh, he didn't save you to be a good mother or be a good daddy. He saved you out of his amazing, wonderful grace. I stand marveled that he even took a notion to do that for me. I stand amazed. Uh, we all sing Amazing Grace, do we not? I think we missed the mark on that. I just stand dumbfounded that he would ever, and at least in my eye, waste time to fool with me. That's amazing, isn't it? By grace are you saved. And then he says in verse uh, number 6, and raised us up together and made, in other words, required, said it that way, completely his will, and have raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might shew his exceeding riches, uh, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Yeah. Not of works, lest any man should right. boast. <laughs> boy, we would. So we find we're just as dead as they are. We're just as useless. Standing very much in the need, the need of the gospel. You know what the the most loving thing you can do for your children is to share the gospel. You know what the most loving thing you can do to the vagrant on the side of the road? Just share the gospel. Uh, <laughs> I told you all this before, how my grandmother would, uh, would feed vagrants when they walked by the house in the 70s. And she tell you the reason she did it. You trained and you you entertained angels unaware, but probably the most compassionate thing I've ever seen. There was a woman. She's a parchment. Lived over at Cumberland City, and she was crippled up. She had fallen as a youth and broke her leg, and it was never set up. And. Uh, She'd go to every meeting, anywhere there was a meeting, Miss Parchman was going to be there. And we had a dinner on the ground in the old church where I grew up at Carlisle. And somebody, well, I know who it was, I ain't going to say, it, say his name, it was her son, left her up. And if y'all know how that building is at, they raised the road up off, 
out of the out of the bottom. He let her walk down that steep bank down to the church, and uh, I didn't think much of it. And then y'all know there's there's eleven steps to get up in that building. Mother made me go help her up, and so. I got this parchment, and, and, and the man of God was preaching, and man, it was hot in July, and that old building didn't have any air conditioner in it, was just all sweating. And I saw Miss Parchment get up, and I figured she had to go to the bathroom. Mother didn't make me take her down there, because we had two outhouses. And uh, here she comes back in a little while with a cold cup of water. Walked it up there to the preacher man, sat it on the pulpit, and sat back down. That's the kind of people we need to be. Now, they didn't have a water fountain either. Y'all ever been down there? There's a spring, a square spring, right by the building. She reached down there at 88 years old and brought up a cup of water and carried it up another 10 steps back into the house of God. Why did she do that? Because she had compassion. She didn't do it to be seen. She didn't do it to impress anybody. She was boy being obedient. Whoever giveth a cup of cool water in my name, she was doing it. Now, the question is, do you have as much compassion as Ms. Parchman had? And I would say, we don't think that deep anymore. That was probably 79, um, 45 years ago now. I don't know that we have that level of compassion in 2022, do you? I would hope we do. The best thing you can do to somebody is to give them the gospel. Mm -hmm. 